I don't know. Okay. There is, you just need to think about, think about what the summarisation aspects are, are. I mean, that's what we're looking for, strong arguments, something that gives us something that, you, that you're bringing to the party as opposed to just reading something and then spitting it back. That doesn't do anything for us. I can get a computer to summarise a paper, you know, it's not rocket science. Okay, that's not the issue. You need to get some knowledge from it, but then give us back something, so some strong arguments, some original thought in the real world, that's going to get you it. So I set, it, I set your exam this week, and of course the original, the, re, the, original, um, the original thought mark represents, of a 20 mark question, represents 6 marks. Okay. The analysis represents probably another 6 marks, sorry, the application of the technique represents probably another 6 marks. So just on those two things, understanding how to analyse and apply new techni techniques, and also understanding about um, uh, uh, um, how to have some original thoughts will get you 60%, will get you 2-1. Okay? Book work, just spitting it back, <coughs> you know, 4 marks. Well, two, yeah, book work, book work, about 4 marks of that. And then discussion with examples is another 6. It's not another 6, it's another, three. yeah, no. Not six. Not six. Four. Number four. Okay? So these kind of things is, is the way you need to be putting your effort into this <coughs> original thinking, into linking, up to, into linking all these sections together. Okay. <coughs> so like I say, if you've got any problems with your feedback, you need to let me know. If you've got any problems with the quality of the feedback, that you think it's not the right, the right quality, you want to know more, I, you know, let me know. Last year people did let me know. We didn't get any mark changes, but I think that we gave more verbal feedback as well, and so they were happier and could do better on the second, um, second one. Who read the exemplars? Oh, quite a few people read the exemplars. Good, so you know, you should know the kind of things that you're looking for. Okay. Um, Anyone want to say a bit more about the the first one and its feedback? The first, because obviously you're going to have what is it? I think it's the 14th of March or something like this. You're going to have to do the. You're going to. Have, that's the deadline for the for the next one for the next. Uh, What's well, the starting point anyway? I think for the next. Um, what's the word? Yeah. Did you find that last year on average students tended to be better or worse on the first one than the other two? They t they, last year they did bizarrely worse because last year they did quite well on the first one and then they all got complacent and screwed the second one. <coughs> okay, but I've reduced the second. I've reduced the number. So for instance, you've got one about um, Xerox. Oh, you know, the Xerox star machine, that's one of the next ones, and then you've got more students. However, last time there was four. There was another one with, um, which was about uh, emotional design. Okay, so you don't, you don't have that emotional design. Yeah. So the only three this time, so you can make it, you should, be able, you should make it uh, sort of, you should have to focus better, I think, on these particular three. But yeah, don't get complacent. The people who did well on the, last, on the first one last time got complacent. And they just thought they could do it. Oh, I can read this and just do 50 words in half a day and screw the second one. And then the, the third one, they went back again because they obviously picked up. Okay. Okay, so anything else? Any, any more questions that people want to know about for the first, for the first assignment in its, in its marks? Okay. Well, let me know if you do. Um, for the newcomers, there's some um, handouts down the bottom here, so uh, you probably want to get them passed back or something like this. Um, okay. So, pop quiz from last week. How would you go about getting the what? So we did this, you, know, you guys did it. In what kind of things do you think are in the what? Not the who. We know about well, let's just talk about the who. who. Of those, there's four who categories that we looked at last week and they're in the notes. Actors. Who's the other who categories? Stakeholders. Stakeholders. <coughs> Proxies. Proxies, yeah, and there's one more. 
Rolls. Rolls. Okay? So those are the four from last week. You notice that while I do have this pop quiz at the start, I, you know, it's more like a jam session really, you know, I'm just moving around, I'm just doing whatever I want, pretty much at the front of me. So I'll be asking other questions. So what, what kind of things, how would you go about getting the what? How would you go about getting the what? What are the, what are the things we need, we might want? Yeah, yeah. current system. Current system, that's a good one. Yeah, current system. More? <coughs> so again? Regulation. Regulation, yeah. Any more? There was five, yeah. Analyzing prior documentation. Why? So link that. Link. This is for your synthesis question. Link analyzing prior documentation to something else we talked about last week in methods. What kind of analysis would we do? Begins with an A. Yeah. Archival, yeah. Archival analysis. So we've got other documentation which you can analyze the archive to see what stuff goes in there, what kind of things are in that documentation. Yeah? Okay. Differences between informal and semi-formal methods. So there was no list of differences. We just talked about it. There's differences in your notes, and we talked about the whole spectrum last week, remember, from informal to um, for, from informal to formal. So what kind of things might you describe informal? Yeah, is it that informal is in natural language, whereas some formal is going to tend to use the language that develops and comes down more? Okay, so that's one. Yeah, so that's one way. That's one. That's one part. <coughs> Any more? Yeah. Informal could be sitting, sitting down chatting with current users. <coughs> Yeah, so you might have this sitting down and chatting, or you might have set questions, and there's variations on that because we've had conversations with a purpose, remember? Okay, yeah? Is it that informal methods encourage uh, change of requirements and not more than semi formal methods? Yes, informal methods encourage changes in requirements. Why? Well, how do we normally note informal methods with, say, if we're talking about methods for communicating with developers or at least trying to get some ideas down? What kind of is it because informal methods are a lot less detailed uh, or less written down and people are more happy to criticise something that something hasn't worked on? Yeah, people are happy to criticise that something hasn't worked on. And also it goes back to point two. So why post it so important? Apart from being obviously invented by God. Yes. They don't have much work involved so you can just chuck them away. They don't have much happen. work involved so you can just chuck them out. Okay, that's good. So that's one of the main reasons why post-its are useful. That's why we have lots of walls. You know, I mean, has anybody been in a development environment? A, you know, hardcore agile development environment, yeah? So, did you used to have post-it walls? Yeah. Okay. So you have massive post-it walls where you can move the design around. And that's for, you know, functionality as well as any kind of user interface stuff. Okay, and the reason why you want it like that is so that it's open, it's accessible to everybody, they can see it all the time, and it doesn't involve doing anything really kind of as though you feel you're going to break anything while you're moving the post it from place to place, <coughs> or chucking one away and writing something new. Okay? Okay. Pick an informal methodology and describe it. That sounds like an exam question, doesn't it? Pick an informal a description question. Maybe a description with an example question. That could be easy, that kind of thing. So, if you're going to pick an informal methodology, or a formal or a semi-formal, well, let's pick an informal methodology. So, pick an informal methodology for, say, communicating. For, trans for, for get communicating with two software engineers. No, getting something down. Not the observation of touch stuff. Use case. Use case. That's kind of informal, yeah. Um, what's What's even more informal and shorter than a use case? Well, the personas of the user stories. User stories, personas are slightly different. Yeah, user stories, yeah. Why are personas different to user stories? I'll say, let me see if anybody else is. Uh, yeah. Because personas don't have to do with how they interact with the system, but also who they are as a person. Yes. Very good. So, 
So user stories are more about um, how people interact with the system, the functionality driven oftentimes, whereas personas are more about the person themselves and how they might interact with the system, they might not mainly who they are. So that, that, puts, that means that a software engineer can understand better what it is that that, that person is about. So are personas aggregates of people or not? Are they about individual, an individual person, or are they about aggregates, of, aggregations of people? They're about aggregations of people displayed as a single Yes, they're about aggregations of people displayed as a single person. Okay. So, what's, so how does a scenario differ, differ to a persona then? Any ideas how a scenario differs from a persona? Yeah. There's a scenario like a persona taking part in, in a use story or trying to do something basically, rather than just what they are, what they're actually trying to do. Okay, so yeah, so the, the, <coughs> the, so the scenario is more about the actual task driven stuff, what it is they want to do and why they want to do it, as opposed to the persona which is more about the person. Okay. So you can see that you could easily synthesise these things together, you could synthesise use cases, your personas, scenarios, you can synthesise uh, um, um, user stories all together to make kind of a more continuum of understanding that you can then give to another. <coughs> okay. Two main danger points to remember when we're taking user experience design. What's the what, what might two danger points be? Okay, you need to Everybody lies or something like Everybody that. Everybody lies, yes. So that's one danger, you know. Everybody lies. Anything else? Yeah? I was gonna say bias of the end of the, the UX person. Bias of the UX. Uh, developer, designer, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Getting your obsessed with designer and functionality. So again? Getting your obsessed with designer and functionality. Getting your obsessed with designer and functionality, that's number one, yeah. Yeah. Uh, people's uh, reaction to the system can change depending on when they use it. Yeah. People's reaction to the system changes depending on whether they, whenever they use it. We can see that people's perception of the system is different as well, and so if they've used the system badly one time and they come back again, they're going to have an expectation that the system's going to be bad a second time, even if you've made changes, good changes, okay? and they'll still give it a lower rating. Um, let's say one more. Bit. One more. <coughs> okay, so there's, there's kind of two dangers. One danger is that, say for instance, well, I'm saying, a danger of focus group. Oh, oh you two. You've got a new contender here. Groupthink. Groupthink, groupthink, okay? And so we can be led by the group, we can be led by an individual in that group. Okay, and so that's the, that's the first one for um, the focus group. What else? So the other one is that, the other one might be, that you might not have spoken to enough people. So while in, say, quantitative, quantitative stuff, work, this is space just in, you can just climb over the desk and go for it. Health and safety if you're on the stairs, who can tell you? Okay, so, um, so you might, we might, so in quantitative work, we, th we feel like we'll have enough people because we need enough to make statistical, <coughs> statistical judgment. But in qualitative work, we might only have a very few people. So if we've just got a one focus group that we're looking at, because why we might we only have one focus group? Yeah. Because of that paper, it says you only need five people. Is that that's on? Yeah. So not the paper five people, Jakob uh, Nelson paper. Yeah, that's. But another, another reason, yes. Is it because it takes a long time and can cost quite a bit? Other stuff can. So focus groups you can do real quick, right? You know, you just get a few people in the room. But the problem with that is that getting a few people in the room having a focus group, or even just interviewing a few people because you've got time limitations, okay, mean that you might not get everybody. In fact, you might get a tiny, of the population, you might get a tiny what? Sample. Sample. So that might be not what? 
Diverse enough or not because we're not rare. Representative. representative. Okay, it might not be representative sample. So that means that you've got a problem there. So you'll be building a system for somebody who doesn't really exist, for a user group who are tiny. Yeah. Whereas the rest of the population don't want that. Okay? So that's one of the that's one of the problems with being in short amount of time. Okay, good. So who's read who read who's read the notes up to part one? Who's read the notes now? Okay, up to this last, last you know, most recent set. Okay, good. And um, who's read uh, Zenny the Automotive Talk about this? <coughs> yes, yes, two. Who's read up to page 200 of Zenny the Automotive Talk of Maintenance? <sighs> Try to introduce some culture into new young business. Oh, I don't know. Right, okay. Let's move on. So we're now going to talk about building stuff <coughs> and the principles that you should have when building stuff. Okay? These are set principles that you can see that are already out there, that are already in the design literature, that are in the research literature, that have evolved over time. Some, at this point, were created that I've thrown away. You'll see in the notes there's some uh, principles that I've thrown out because they're repeated or I think that they were, they were done badly back in the day, and now they've become part of our group because you can use your people, but they're probably not, not right. Okay? I've listed them in the notes, so that when it, you go into a company and somebody tells you this, you'll know, why the, you'll, know, you'll know what they're talking about. Somebody, when somebody talks to you about this stuff, you'll know what they're talking about, and you'll also know why they're wrong. Okay? So, what are the five things that user experience that I say that I say user experience is based on? Not everybody else, you can all say different. But seeing that I'm on up front, I get to say these five things. So what are the five things that I think user experience uh, so certainly design and best practice uh, built on? Build and best practice built on. First one, oh yeah? Uh, efficiency. Okay, but what's the first one? Oh. Uh, the, okay. Which we don't cover. Because it's kind of Oh, utility. Utility. So there's got to be some reason for it. Otherwise, you're just, you know, howling in the dark. What's the point? So you've got to be some utility behind it. Here, we've got effective. It's kind of on the screen, so that's good. That's what we're looking at today. Effective experience. We've got efficient experience. So what do we, so I'm saying effective experience. You might know <coughs> there's another term. So what kind of experience do you think effective experience? I might, I might be... I might, uh, uh, you might know this by another term, that's good. Accessibility. Okay? Although, I do accessibility, and I take a, uh, I take a bit of a different view on it, and we'll see why. Okay, so we've got effective, and then we've got efficient. So what's efficient experience? What's another name for efficient experience? Optimal. Optimal. And is it usability? Usability. So we've got accessibility and usability, and efficient experience and usability go together. They're coming, they come really from the old school where we have, in the old school HCR, what do we mainly have? Quantitative, Quantitative stuff, where we want to measure stuff, and we want metrics, and we want numbers, and we want you know, task completion times. Okay? That kind of thing. Okay, and then we have, what else? Oh, that's the first three. What's the next one? Affective experience. So what do you think affective experience is all about? <laughs> Anybody else? Affective experience? How the, how the user feels when they use, use the system. Yeah, it's emotion. Emotional response, how they feel when they use the system. Or think about using the system. And what's the final one? I was like, even, come on, some more people who are looking dis, you know, kind of disinterested. Ah. Yeah. Money, okay, so that's another one. Yeah, I've changed the title of this a few times because I, you know, it's difficult to. I did originally had digital umami, which I really like as a bit of jargon term, so on. but it kind of disparages it a bit because it's just like it doesn't mean anything really. So what else? What am I calling it now? What else might we want to call it? Is it a bit more weight? Last year I then called it dynamic, but now I call it something else. Engagement. 
Okay? So some kind of engagement. And we're looking at various parts of this kind of engagement and what things are all about as we go through these next few lectures. So, who's heard of uh, Ling's cars? Ling's cars, okay, so it's in your notes. So Ling's cars is a nightmare of the highest order as a website. Okay? So really, really horrible. It does everything you're not supposed to do. Designers hate it. They, they really hate it. Okay? But, people who use it love it. And they, they're thrashing around Ling's cars at home. It's terrible, it's terrible. Okay, but it's really so what we need to so one thing I want you to be thinking about in the next few weeks is why do we think without reading the notes, please, why do we think Ling's cars is like that? I mean I'm just giving you my opinion in the notes. Okay, why do you think people really buy into this Ling's cars thing? I'm just giving you my opinion in the notes, nobody really knows. Okay. So that's one thing I want you to look at. So well, let me see whether, just as a just as a side issue, whether we can actually do this. Oh, this is interactive experience stuff. Where's the uh, oh, Windows? How do I make the web work on Windows? Oh, Um, 
it's also about ageing. And it's about physical disability. That's what it's originally intended to be about. Okay, these, are, these issues. As well, there's some other issues, there's some other areas that are kind of on the borderline that have been pushed in there. One of them is called situational impairment. Okay? So, what's situational impairment? Any ideas? Yeah. If you're driving, it's kind of, yes. So situation impairment normally goes with mobility and with mobile phone usage and that kind of thing. It's first suggested by Sears, Andrew Sears, um, when he was at Vault some more, okay, in about 2003. Um, and it's gained more kind of popularity, this, this idea of situation impairment. And we used to use the, and in reality, and I'm going to use a politically incorrect term, it's about because I want it to be strong. It's about not people with disabilities, but it's about <coughs> environment handicapping, handicapping the user. Not anything about any about any disability that the user might have. Okay. Um, so the situation impairment too, but I think it's much broader than this. And I think by just saying accessibility, it puts people in a frame set, a mindset of all disability, oh dear. Okay, and that's not what it's about, in my opinion. It's about how could this that effective experience? Okay, so I heard this effective experience discussed at some length by a guy called Jim Thatcher from IBM. Okay, so he was very much into this idea of, uh, of, of are we effective in what we're doing? So we need to be effective before, before we can do anything really. So, why it's not just accessibility? Um, the connotations of disability are the main thing, as I've just said. But also, it's much broader than disability. Okay, access to information is much broader than disability. For instance, without the training that you've received, maybe even with the training you've received, well, let's start to say without the training that you've received over these three years, how likely is it that you could understand that research paper that you read two weeks ago and then commented on? Is that, is that research paper accessible if I gave it to just somebody in the street? Would they know what, what it meant? Or indeed, would they understand what the issues were? Answers? Not so much. Maybe. Not so much, maybe? Depends. Not so much. But when I read, say, a hardcore physics paper, I'm likely to not understand it very well. Unless it's explained to me in a language I can understand, and most of these, these things aren't, so therefore they're not accessible to me. Okay. Um, if you come to this country from a foreign country and we don't speak the language, or we don't speak the language very well, then there's a bar, there's a barrier there. <coughs> you don't have access to maybe all the um, aspects of society, in the, including the governmental society and uh, civil society, that you might expect to have, because there's a language barrier. Okay, so that's an access issue too, in my opinion. So, in the modern world, Twitter world, obviously I presume you're all following Comp 3352 Twitter feed and you're tweeting yourself into all these domains, of course. Um, accessibility is seen as hashtag A, and then there's a Y at the end, but what's in the middle? There's a number in the middle. So you'll see accessibility written as... <coughs> A11Y. And you'll also see something else written. What do you think I18N is? Is this kind of standardization? Like this? No, really. Interaction? No. Is it like an aid guide? No. <laughs> it might be like, I don't know, if there's like young followers on Twitter, it might, okay. it might be that I don't state that. You know. okay. no, no, it's not, no. I thought you guys would be down with the young kids, but not actually. Too old for Okay, so this, these numbers represent the numbers, the number of characters between the I and the N. And this means internationalisation. 18 characters, and this means accessibility, 11 characters. Okay, so this is what, so when you see these kind of codes, you'll see them a lot, actually, in, in accessibility.
responsibility and internationalisation, which is about, which is also about an effective experience. You see these codes a lot. That's what they mean. So if you see, if you're seeing the code, if you're seeing a, a word with a number in the middle, it's just the number of characters they're missing. Okay, they're jumping. So it's like, for instance, and it comes from things like. Um, Don't. This thing here signifies we're missing a character, right? Which is O. Okay. Yeah. So, why is this necessary to because in the save real world, characters? Huh? To save characters or what? Yeah, to save characters, yeah. And that's also cool. Save characters on Twitter, you need to do that. But it's also cool. It's also, so instead of saying internationalization, you can say I hate to know. Or I can say, Ali. Yeah? As opposed to accessibility. So when people say, oh, this is a really good thing for Ali, you don't in your job, they'll be using, this is what they'll mean. Why are they I'm not very convinced. Just because it's in the same order. Wait, I mean, if you read that, like with L's, it would be Ali. Yeah, but it's just the way it's pronounced. Yeah. Yeah, it's just the way it's pronounced. It is, isn't it? Okay. So that's what you'll know. Now, I think that effective equals the ability to produce an effect, where everything here is in ability. Okay, that's what we're looking at, the ability to produce an effect. Yeah? That's the main point. So that's what we're going to look at now. It's not about accessibility or anything else, it's about the principles for the ability to produce an effect. Okay, so access is for everyone, that's what I'm telling you, and the reason why I'm telling you is because I think that, here, well, here's one story, certainly. So who's, who knows the live view cycle gadget from Sony, I think it is? It's part of Sony's ecosystem. No? Live view? Um, so this like, lets you build a gadget, build something for, on your phone, an app on your phone, and transmit data via Bluetooth to some other kind of big gadget. This thing here is a little screen, okay, that you can just hang, bang onto it. And so the, this, this data is here. While pedaling a Boris bike, I start to shuffle in my pocket. Where is the damn iPhone? Okay. Uh, finally, I find it. The next change is to get it out of my pocket while still navigating the humbly of the bike world. Obviously, Boris bikes are massive. Eventually, I give up. I pull over, get my phone out, and look at the nearest docking station in spaces. So what they're trying to do here is find the docking station of where they can park the, the Boris bike. However, it's a lot more code, so therefore there's a problem in effective access. Okay, because you've got to stop, get, the pocket, get your phone out, start messing around. This is just a watch on your wrist that tells you where to go for the docking, for the bikes, to dock your bike. Okay, just look at it. Now this might seem like a reasonably trivial thing. You might go, well, it doesn't matter. Whether you can access this or not, it doesn't matter. But oftentimes, Things are time sensitive. Okay, probably somebody with a visual disability could actually um, understand or at least get complicated te complicated text from a complicated layout in the end. But it might take them 20 times longer than you might do. Okay, to get a pricey of a page, if you are visually disabled, if you're sighted, you can probably do a, get pricey of a page in about five seconds. Well, if that. But if you're visually disabled, it's going to take you a lot longer. Some, in some cases, we did some experimentation. What a sighted user could do in five seconds, a visually disabled user had to get a post of the page in about two and a half minutes. Well, that makes you much, much less productive if you're in a work environment for a start. Okay? So even though eventually you might be able to get some, some use, and something might be accessible, might be effectively, you might be effectively able to use it, that's not necessarily the case when it comes to time. And this time differentiation is called accessibility in use. Okay? So whether things are accessible in use, of course, your iPhone, probably when you're on the bike, isn't accessible. But this thing on your list is. Okay. But it's more critical for disabled users. So here we've got a quote from a blind user. For me, the computer systems are everything. They're my high fire, my source of income, my supermarket, my telephone, they're my way in. They're my way in, not to computers, but to society, to life, to living. Very few people understand your, uh, and can read Braille. Most people go blind when they're, um, when they're older. They're not born blind. Okay. 
And so that means that you have a problem with trying to teach Braille or Moon to older users. So people when they are born blind are called congenitally blind, and people when they go blind are called advantageously blind. Okay? And so therefore, when you get people who go advantageously blind, it means that they need some other way, and that's text to speech synthesis. Okay? It's all there. So therefore, everything, there's no there's no need, there's no there's very little tactile. Okay? So who's seen any blind tactile stuff? So you can get little pitoelectric displays which show Braille and they'll cost you from 80 characters around £3,000 to get an 80 character display -ish. Okay, So that's also expensive whereas text-to-speech is actually on most operating systems now. Why is it on most operating systems now? Is it, is it on most operating systems because it's a good and wholesome thing to do? No. Yes. Selling to more people, mainly selling to one particular people. Yeah. No? Not necessarily. It's because you can't sell it to the US government if it doesn't meet 508 standards. So it's only, it's not, it's only in a federal government context. So Apple couldn't sell to the government if they didn't have a screen reader as part of their system, so it's effectively, effectively accessible. Yeah? Okay, so it's really important for people with disabilities, but it's important for everybody really. Because you don't know at what time you're not going to be able to, um, you might want an audi auditory interface if you're driving. Okay? So then you become situationally impaired and you need that. So there's lots of reasons why you might want this. How do they get around this kind of situ situational impairment in, say, Flight on flight deck systems. How do you get around the situation? Yeah. Yeah, you've got a head up display so you can see where the data is and wherever you look, then you've got data in your field of vision so you can land the plane as well as see what's happening. And what other things happen on a flight deck? Surely we've all seen those, you know, 747 crash video things where you get the, yeah. Auditory alarms. Yes, auditory. auditory alarms. So a lot of the auditory alarms occur when a stall is going to happen, or you're in, when you're in imminent stall. Okay, you see lots of those kind of um, uh, alarms. You get the same kind of thing in gliders. Okay, but with gliders, it's called a vario. And the vario is so that you can understand how high or high, how, how what's your rate of climb or what's your rate of descent. Okay, all of that's important for what? What kind of situational, we've talked about impairment, but what, what's important in these kind of safety critical systems? Situational, begins with an A afterwards. Mm -hmm. Awareness. Situational awareness is critical in all of these kind of more complex uh, tasks that you, do, that you might be programming systems to do. But they're all effective use. Okay, so barriers to effective use. I'll give you. I'm going to just click through here and let you see a couple of uh, YouTube videos. Um, who's seen screen reader users? People who are using screen readers. Okay, so screen reader users are really very good at auditory. Very good at listening. Obviously, they have to be. So, words per minute wise, you can get up to a huge amount of words per minute. I've seen blind users listening to 600 words a minute. It's not intelligible to most people, okay? Because it's so fast. Why is it? Why does it matter that it's so fast? Why is it so fast? So they're not waiting, but because they, they can listen to it at that speed, yeah. as opposed to waiting the time waiting for it to be at sort of a low speed that most people are to hear out. Yes. That's, that's the main reason. Well, in your exam or in the, in the work that you'd be doing, you'd want to link up what I said about the fact that it takes, there's a five second overview for visually for sighted users and make sometimes a two and a half minute lag for blind users, you might want to say so you can cut down that lag. Okay, so that's the kind of thing. Synthesize these two things together. So yeah, that's absolutely right. Okay. So 
So let's see if this works. Say, say, I will press the insert key and the F6 key. And as I navigate around these headings, Okay, it's telling me what those headings are. And that's that's also telling me that the piece has been well structured, it's been well laid out. How easy was it to hear that? It's just very difficult to hear it even like this because the voicing is really, really poor on most stuff. So anyway, well that's just talking, that's just giving you the headings that are available. That's not telling you anything really that you couldn't get sighted in about just a second. If I want to, I hear a heading, if I want you to go and visit that heading, I press the tab key to move to that heading. And, and then it takes me straight directly to that, to that page. So in that sense, it, it's been very well laid out. Another way is, is how do I navigate around the site? How is someone available to appear using the screen reader who doesn't have any site navigate around the site? Well, hyperlinks, of course, the links, the, the way that, that people do uh, click to links to get to different places is also important for a screen reader user. And then this time I'm going to use another hot, series of hot keys, and it's going to be the insert key in F7. Okay, and it's telling me that I know the links list box, but it's important that these links have been logically labelled, otherwise it might not make any sense. So what we have to avoid when you're writing a good website is to ensure that you don't have lots of click here's, click here's, click here's, otherwise it doesn't mean anything to anyone. So as I move through the links, we've got an information day, there's raising a range at Cobridge College, we've got some staff vacancies, we're journeying through the college. So let's see how someone with a visual payment would journey through the college. So I'm going to move to the link button. I'm going to activate that link. And again, it's telling me that the page has three headings and a certain number of links. So uh, you can see it's, it's fairly straightforward using the screen reader to, to navigate the way around, around the site just by using um, a, a, a screen reader called George or, or any other suitable screen reader. Okay, so how, you know, he's saying now it's so straightforward for me to uh, navigate around the site. How straightforward did that sound? Okay, that's the kind of, that's like straightforward in a really bad world. You know, <laughs> simple as that. Um, so the thing you should be noticing about that is there's lots of additional metadata attached to what's going on. So people are saying heading level two, heading level three. Why do you think that matters? The hierarchy of the design. So you can see the hierarchy of the design because obviously we, if you're sighted, you can see that by the size and the style of each of the headings, normally the size of the text. But you're not going to know the size of the text if it doesn't tell you that it's heading level two, and then it's heading level three, or it's heading level four. Okay? So when there was a big move to actually make everything cascade with CSS, uh, to use CSS, say, in websites, then some people just said, right, we're going to make it big and bold, but we're not going to give it a heading, which meant that it broke all this stuff, because as, as far as sighted users, were uh, blind users were concerned, all that happened was that people were just, um, that the, the language and the text was just all the same thing. Okay. Um, anything else there? What, what did he say in the middle? What's really important when you're labelling things? And it's the same for Java accessibility bridges, etc. Okay, so yeah, you can Naming the links, what they're actually referring to. Right? Yeah, naming the links instead of just saying click here or making the same link, or making different links have the same text on the page means that you have no idea where things are. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, does the screen reader only like, capture links that are marked up with anchor text? Yes. So you can't like say in some other way that like make this div a link so that the screen reader no, it's just anchor tags. It's just anchor tags. I mean, what you can get is some of the new screen readers are able to look at um, ARIA, so they look at, they're able to look at the kind of the JavaScript stuff. <coughs> okay. um, they look at AJAX, okay, so they, they create what's called ARIA, which is an accessible rich internet 
um, application. So generally this means that if you've got JavaScript in, in there and you're generating links from an event, then you can also see that because there's a thing called a DOM, a, do, a document object model, um, model mutation event. Okay? So what happens is that the DOM mutants event, mutation event shows that there's a change in the document object model behind the scenes. Okay? So it's this there's a change in the code. So most, most visually disabled users are far more computer savvy, technically savvy than a standard user. Way more. They're Uber users really, because they have to be. Okay? Okay, and here's one that's, that, here's a little uh, clip of uh, sign language, you might see. Sign language. Why does it matter to you guys? Yeah. Because it's not accessible, so you can't understand. Yeah. So it's not accessible to you. You can't understand it. But what you should also remember is if you're um, if you're if you're hearing impaired and you can't hear, then sign language is different to um, braille because sign language is your first language. English is not. So it's an internationalisation issue in some ways. Okay, so British Sign Language is its own language, and English is not the first language of anybody who speaks BSL or, or American Sign Language. Okay. So that means that you might say, oh well, textual content's fine, because somebody who's hearing impaired can read it. But not necessarily that's not necessarily the case, because that's not their first language. Okay, textual language isn't. It's uh, sign language. Okay? So that's another thing to consider. So therefore you can say, well actually this is just language. This is an internationalization issue. Okay. So some additional barriers to to um, to effective use, I think. First one, internationalisation, language and understanding. Okay. The other one is literacy. Okay, so I think literacy is also in there in the accessibility stuff. So who's heard of Flash Kincaid? Well, it's two people, Flash and Kincaid. Okay, so they do a, a, a language rating score so that you can see how complicated your language is. Okay, so you can put a web page through, um, through one of these processes and then they'll give you out back a mark on the Flash Kincaid score. And that flashing case will tell you how complicated the language is and how and what grade level it's American, what grade level somebody needs to be to be able to understand the language you're using. Okay? So it's interesting when you're writing stuff to see what kind of words you're writing that you think are perfect, perfectly acceptable and understand, but realise that people who are maybe only educated up to say the age of 16 would not understand. Yeah? Okay. Uh, situational, I think we've done this, mobile. Um, developing regions. So I talk about developing regions because I think there's a, some unconventional use there of stuff. Okay? It's in, your, it's, in your, it's in there as well. Okay, so um, in, your, uh, in developing regions we've got this kind of unconventional, unconventional use. But do we think this is all one way? Do we think that, that of all of this, is there anything for us to learn, if you like, as software engineers, as user experience people? What did I talk about when we talk about this user experience? Did I talk about and the kind of laboratory-based stuff in the last few in the last few lectures? We talked about kind of emergence. So there's emergent use that comes from all of this stuff. Okay. So here we've got unconventional use of stuff in developing regions. Without looking at notes, any ideas about what that unconventional use might be? kind of uses might be unconventional when it comes to technology or products that you didn't expect or we didn't expect to occur? Is this smart phone to make phone calls? Is it 
Pardon? You use smartphone to make phone calls. You use smartphone to make phone calls, okay. What else?
So, we'll have a coffee break back at 10 past or 11 minutes past the back.
Right, so technical accessibility issues or barriers to this kind of using different kind of ways that you might also need to think about when you're developing. So why do you always become a problem? And you know when I'm talking, that means you guys shut up. Unless you're talking to me. So yeah? Okay. So there may be in one language uh, for the people who can see, yes. These different types of applications which are kind of bespoke give me some different inconsistency among the many types of application which could be from an issue. Yeah, okay, so you've got different kinds of viewing that might come from an issue with some people. Yeah. They kind of rely on the reliable black representation message yeah. which you can't create with Spotify and you have to use this big kind of graphics. Yeah, so they're they're very graphic based and uh, therefore it's it's kind of graphical layout and you can't really see what's going on if you can't see it of course. Um, now why didn't this why why does it what happened before GUIs? What was before GUIs? Command line. Okay, so was command line okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Um, so command line is command line was good because you can easily you know it's just text, so you can easily speak the text. What what's the other thing about GUI is that that it's asking you to do cognitively. Multiple things are going on on the screen in one go, right? It's a parallel delivery in a lot of ways. Whereas text on the command line isn't parallel delivery, it's just one thing. So it's just gonna you're just gonna get the text screen. Which means everything is linear and will be spoken in that linear order in which it's encountered. But there's a problem in queries whereby you might, for instance, who uses Growl? Who's got Growl notifications? Okay, so some people have got Growl notifications. And these are these are system-wide, those in general, they're system-wide notifications, which are notifications of lots of different stuff from, from different applications. So it might tell you when you've got new email, it might tell you when you've got new tweets, that kind of thing, or when there's an error that's occurred. So these notifications will, if you're in, actually do, interrupt the way that you look at the page, right, or the way that you look at the screen, because obviously your eye is attracted to a growl notification and then skips back to what you're doing. However, that's going to be really, really confusing and annoying in an auditory stream, okay, because you've got a bit of text, it's being spoken, and then suddenly something pops in and gives you a completely out of context message. But you don't know it's out of context, and then it keeps speaking. What's happened before? Or what, what you already, what the, the paragraph or the text you already looking at? Yeah? Okay, so that's a problem for lots of viewers. It's not just the visual and the graphic way that things are, it's also the way that the screen is orchestrated. The communication with you as a user is orchestrated. That's a problem too. Okay, so we used to have this thing called screen scraping, and it's old school. Okay, so screen scraping you just used to look at what was being displayed on the screen all of the time, and try to understand what that text was, and then scrape it off the screen. Okay, and we just and at that point we just decided yes, this is it. You know, we've got we know what's what's being pushed on the screen when it's being pushed on the screen. That's and that's as much as we can understand. There's no meaning, there's no semantics, there's no context really to it, it's just what's being pushed on the screen. So that's called screen scraping. We have this other thing called the off-screen model. So who knows anything about the document object model? Okay, so what, who wants to tell me something about the document object model on a web page? Sort of like the hierarchy of the elements displayed in the page. So you've got like the HTML the root and like body and head and then it's yeah. just like a tree structure. Yeah, so you've got the hierarchy of what's displayed on the page, you've got the body, the head, the tree, the tree structure, the structure of the, of the page, and the semantics that go with it too. Okay, so that's what a document object model is. What's an on-screen model? Who's done software engineering in Agile? Everybody's done software engineering in Agile, for God's sake. It's an elbow test, pretty much, isn't it? You've all done software engineering, haven't you? In your second year, or was that all a big nightmare that you've chosen to forget and you know, you really cancel it or something for it? You know, don't think about it again, talking therapy doesn't work, that kind of thing. Okay, so you've all done software engineering, right? 
Okay, most of you are having a So an on-screen model. So the on-screen model is the thing that's actually rendered. Yeah. So that's the thing that's that's rendered on the screen. Okay. The off-screen model is a model of what of the of the connections behind the screen, and you'll find it more in the code base. Okay. So when you're building buttons. There'll be space for attributes, there'll be space for uh, meaning, there'll be space for the name of the colour maybe, etc, etc. Those things are form part of the off-screen model that's created before it's rendered onto the screen. The off-screen model means that it's, you build a picture of what the interaction looks like and what the interface looks like, but not related to any particular visual, any particular output. And then you can render that in audio, you can render it visually. Okay? Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't we normally just refer to that as a model? Just a model and what it's going with is a, a view. Yes. In model view controllers, then in the model view controller world, then yes, we would say there's a model and a view. However, it's slightly different in this case because with a model view controller, you have the model, you have the view, you have the control, and you generate it all together, right? So there is some runtime stuff there, but not lots. Here, it's all runtime stuff. That screen model is generated in runtime, okay, dynamically as it goes. Yeah? Okay. So I was going to say, what mainstream, what mainstream technology is something like the off-screen model? We've already said it one time. I'm just... So it's at the start, so you need to be able to make these connections. Yeah. Yeah, well, the document object model. So I said just now, or you said, <coughs> the document object model has this structure and hierarchy behind screens, and then we say, yeah, we can render it into the web page. And then now we say that's kind of an off screen model. Okay? So you need to be able to synthesize these two together, yes. Um, what if you, would you class like creating uh, instances of classes that could then be like, the trade in any output on any page um, when, when, when it's needed as, as an off-screen model, like initiating classes from like a database? Um, okay, so the off-screen I, I, off model I consider that, I wouldn't consider that to be part of the off-screen model directly. And the reason why I wouldn't is because the off-screen model is far more interesting about the, the meaning or the stuff that's in that class. Okay. okay. So for instance, you might have a class where the button it might be button class, where the button isn't is an instant is instantiated but not fully described. Okay. okay. So now in the off-screen model, because it's not fully described, it, visually we know it's a button and we can say <coughs> present this button, draw this button to the you know the, the, the uh, GTK or you know any toolkit you're using. So, but we don't know what this what the meaning of that button might be. Maybe it's a button that's just red. Okay. So there's some implied. Um, meaning in that. And, that, and so therefore it could be generated in the off-screen model, it, it could be generated as kind of an off-screen model, but we wouldn't know what red means, there's no meaning to it, it's not annotated properly, there's no attributes with it. So what we might want to say is, you know, uh, yes, this is okay, or not, this isn't okay. So you can still have a red button, but then you'd label it in the off as part of the text for the off-screen model as okay, or cancel, or don't press the red button, or something. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so here's one kind, there's a number of these different kinds of um, sort of uh, technologies that are sitting, I mean, you probably don't realise it, but sitting between you and your output. And these are, the, we've got the uh, Microsoft Ac uh, Active Accessibility, MSAA, and that's, and that's part of UI automation, user interface automation. We've also got the new one, which is uh, the super cool everything going on at the moment, which is iAccessible 2. Okay. So these create automatically for you the off-screen model as long as you've annotated all your code base correctly. Okay. So when you've got little um, uh, fields when you're generating, say, um, interface components, that you think, oh, I'm not going to fill that in because it's just rubbish. It's just some, want some description. I don't need that description. The reason why you're being asked to, for a lot of this information is not because it's going to be direct, directly rendered to the users on an on-screen model, cited. But it might very well be used as part of this accessibility bridge, okay? as part of this accessibility API. So you get this benefit for you without having to do anything if you make good applications. So making good applications gives you, means that this 
um, means that the application here, which uses the MSAA or something like this, can easily translate between it and the accessibility tools. So, for instance, now, if you want to, so who knows what, um, you, know, you all know what, you're all familiar with UI Chrome, right? Not the browser Chrome, but user interface Chrome. Do you all know what user interface Chrome is? No. So user interface Chrome is on this on this reader here. The bit at the top, the toolbar, and all the crap is Chrome. Is the Chrome? Okay. The stuff in the middle is the content. Okay. So the stuff that's part of the user interface is just called the Chrome. Okay, so when you're doing, when you're talking about user interface, you can, you're talking about lots of different things. So if you're talking about, oh well, we're going to make a modification to the Chrome, what you need is something to do with this, this up here. Okay, and around the bottom. Yeah. Okay. So when you're building Chrome using your uh, toolkits. You can easily make sure that everything is commented properly. You don't have to do anything more than that. Okay? And what, you, what that may, means is that you're then able to take advantage of this. So the, the, the point we were trying to make is that on that screen ring that we were, that we were hearing earlier on, it actually hooks up to the accessibility <coughs> page so that when you want to move for a file, when you want to go file save, save, it's able to control file save with UI automation and also with the accessibility bridge. So it's able to understand what file means, it's able to understand and speak that control 2 or something, control F or alt F is the file, is a hot key for the file. Okay. Of, the, of the automation we just saw, what was important? What was he, what was he doing a lot of in that screening window? Was using hotkeys a lot. You use hotkeys a lot because it's far quicker, obviously, than trying to navigate user automation, UI, uh, UI automation, or accessibility. It's a lot. It's a lot easier to navigate to use hotkeys if you can remember them, okay, than it is to actually be picking visually from the Chrome. Because you have to wait for everything to work it to to render order in an auditory way. So you have to wait for the menu to be spoken, then press the next button, wait for that menu to be spoken, it's also going to say you've just pressed the tab key, tab again, tab, 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 and wait for it to be spoken. Okay, so it's a lot easier to use shortcuts. So you should make sure that where there's a space for a shortcut in your Chrome, you include the shortcut. Yeah? Don't just say, oh well, we'll pick it from the, uh, you know, they'll just pick that, don't, don't worry about it, they'll pick it using the mouse, because they won't be using the mouse, okay? Or they might not be. So lots of things to remember there. <coughs> now, <coughs> we have other aspects of um, accessibility issues. So we have this platform independence idea. So if you actually annotate things better, you get platform independence, okay? Because we understand how things need to be translated between platforms, so it's not just <coughs> accessibility for visual. What we're trying to do in, in most of this stuff is put in semantics, put in meaning, make something that's implicit currently explicit. Okay? Something that's implied by colour, or the way it looks, or the way it's situated, or where its location is, you want to make that explicit, so we know what it is that it does and why it does it. That's what we're trying to do. So then anything can render that. Okay. All right, we'll get on to these. So, we have some potted <coughs> principles which have already been created about accessibility. Now, some of these principles are mushed up from W3C. Some of these principles are mushed up from various other accessibility consortia. Some of them are part of the ISO standard. You'll see in your notes that I list all of those. The good thing about this with accessibility and this kind of effective ability to use something is that, is that um, everybody pretty much agrees. So that's good. Because when we come to usability, you'll find very few people agree okay, about what's usable and usability kind of wise. So this, everybody pretty much agrees. And you have an initial set of things. So perceivable, can you see it? Why have I put C in quotes? Yeah. Lightning. 
visually see? Yes. Just be able to access that information? Yeah, so it might not be visually seeable, okay, it's perceivable. Can you get to it in some way? Can your senses in some way understand what it is? Okay, that's the first one, perceivable. Next one, is it operable? Are you able to use it? So if you're creating something, if you can't use the mouse, how will you get to use this thing that you've created as a software engineer? Okay, will it be a shortcut key, will it be a hot key, what will it be? Okay, is there some other way? The voice control you're expecting or what? If it's voice control, what happens if somebody has a speech impediment? Etc. Okay? So that's the, that's the next thing. Operable. Can you, can you operate it? Understandable. Okay, so is this thing understandable? So therefore, how many people have seen error codes which they don't understand but obviously mean something to somebody else? I've seen them. Okay? Nightmare scenario. So therefore, there's an accessibility issue to the error code, because you don't know what it is. Or an error code which is just a stupid number, and it says consult the operating manual, which, you know, doesn't exist. Okay, so those kind of things are problems. You can't understand it. But that also is the case for jargon. So as software engineers, you use a lot of jargon. I, knew, I was at IKEA the other day, sadly for my students. The nightmare scenario, which is their user experience. I was at IKEA the other day, and um, you look at the way that the actual IKEA staff are using their computer systems, and if they don't understand what a lot of the terminology is, what of the, a lot of the jargon is, they're screwed. Due to the fact that it's been written by software engineers who, who are using different kinds of different terms, okay, which are just terms that only really a software engineer would understand. Okay? So is it understandable to everybody, or as many people as possible? That's the other thing. Now, if you're creating a bespoke system for a set population, like a sales and order system for, I don't know, for various sets of people, what can we say about understandability there? Is it okay to use jargon? My answer is yes. It's okay to use jargon as long as it's not your jargon. It's got to be their jargon. So if, you, if, they, if they commonly refer to some kind of part of the sales process, say, in some particular way, then they all know that because it's a language that they all use as a population. And so therefore, tying into that language makes them feel more secure. In all cases, it should be about the language that you, not that, that, that they want to use, not that you want them to use. Okay, to make it understandable. So for instance, I used to work at Rich Cole back in the day, and there used to be a thing called a land sale. Now, has anybody any idea what a land sale is? No, nobody has any idea. Go on, you can put your hand up. Just a guess. What? Buying stuff so you can get coal out of it. No. no. <laughs> it's called a land sale. Um, and it's it's very strange. Um, Ask any collier and they'll know what a land sale is, but everybody else doesn't know. And a land sale is just a wave bridge whereby if you're selling something by a truck, then you, you then you, you take it to the land sale and you weigh it on the land sale. That's it. So if you're if you say a wave bridge to a collier, you're referring to a rail wave bridge. Okay, not a road wave bridge, because then it's a land sale. So if you, you if you so therefore using the terminology and the jargon for that particular population is a useful thing. Uh, for my sins, I did used to weigh uh, lorries. Anyway, um, robust is it fault tolerant? Okay, so that's another thing. Obviously, if it falls down at the time, then yeah, there we are. So again, you see, I'm kind of an ordinary character. Um, you know, I'm crotchety. So again, I don't hold for these just these four. Now these four <coughs> mean something. P O U R. You'll hear this poor. Okay. So you say, oh, are you conforming to poor? And when you say, when someone says, oh, are you conforming to poor? You say, oh yes, perceivable, operable, understandable, robust. Okay. That's what you're conforming to. <coughs> so when people say, oh, you're doing poor, yeah, you're doing poor. Okay. Now, the better version, or the version that I think is more accurate, is footstool. It's not our footstool. But perceivable, operable, oh, 
open, so therefore is it open to prog programmatic extension? That's the one that I'm interested in. So in this way, if your system is open to programmatic extension, then it means that you're able, that other people are able to create applications in their image, in the image that in the, to do the things that they want to do, which can be completely different to the things that you thought you ought to do. Okay? So why is this useful? This is useful in what kind of interface? The with an R. R. Uh, yeah. Yeah. RESTful interfaces? Have you heard of RESTful? If you haven't heard of REST, then you should find out about it, because it's uh, excellent. But RESTful interfaces. It's kind of one of the ways that uh, Twitter and Facebook and all those kind of guys can hook up to various apps. They provide an API with this RESTful interface. Yeah? Okay, so that kind of thing. So therefore, you can build stuff for you know, different clients, different kinds of clients. With Twitter, there's, you know, even there's Twitter clients for blind users, set up for blind users. They're not expecting, for instance, that just one kind of uh, application suits everybody. Okay, or every device. So, we have a RESTful interface. Okay, so it's open. Again, understandable, can you understand it, and flexible. So I think flexible is really key. Is it flexible to adaptation? So therefore, is your system open to adaptation such that a user can personalise it, can adapt it, to make, can they make it more like them? Okay, more to do with them. Okay, so that's what we look at. Between that, between flexible and open. So open means that is it open? To, it, can you create? Can somebody else, like a like a programmer, create a tool that then fits your image, if you like? Whereas flexible means can you do it? If you're the user, can you actually create? Can you modify stuff in the interface so it fits in with you better? Okay. So that was a big problem I had last year with Ubuntu when it went to stupid desktop as opposed to uh, uh, the standard one, so, we have, so I just used Xability from then on. However, the reality is that if they'd have given multiple options to be able to do that, that would be better because it would conform to me and I would still be using the standard Ubuntu release, but they didn't. Okay. So. The kind of footstools that your grannies had, what they used to call them? Yes. So, I will remember this as poof, <coughs> as opposed to poof. Okay. Those are the kind of footstools grannies have. What are we doing my kind of world anyway? Okay. <coughs> so, let's move on. So, facilitate perceivability. You can obviously read all this stuff in your notes. Okay. As you go. So what do we think we need to do to facilitate perceivability then? Before I, I'm not going to go through all, I'm going to, there's a whole load hidden here, but let's just do it verbally now and then we can just whip it through. Perceivability, what kind of stuff do you think we need to think about to make things perceivable, to make things seeable? Yeah. Not, not just use words, so use things that you what's the word? associate with doing certain actions. With yeah, you can use associations. Okay, yeah. You could metaphors for a start as well, like a cart or a shopping cart, but, you know. That's a little thing, yeah. Okay, anything else? So you can actually just use it. See it. Yeah? You can make sure your structure is there, standardised and something which is often seen. Yeah, standardised structure. That's a good one, especially with regard to operating systems that are, that are in common use, yeah. That's why we're trying to make we've got standard hot key setup or standard short key things. Short key things. Yeah? Any others? Okay, well we've got here, does your system convey information by colour alone? Same. But without ultimate text description, that's one we've got. So if you will say, so if if you see well, I see a lot of this where something goes wrong and they put the text in red to say there's an error. Draw draw your attention to it and say there's an error. Do we think it's highly likely or unlikely that the programmers still will tell you what they put a little thing there that's actually bold or something or speak or auditory bold or say this is a warning somewhere? No. Let's put it in red. Because you think you'll know that red's a warning and green's go. We used to we had it in, in fact we had it here, we had a traffic light system for one of our systems called EPROC for the PhD students. It was, you know, red if there's something going wrong or green if everything's okay, and of course there was no annotation to that. 
so blind users and blind PhD students didn't know whether they were, you know, whether there was a problem or not. Is there a symptom meaningful name on each, on each of the controls? Does it describe, does that name describe everything they need to know about that in one go? In one chunk if they possibly can. Can you just personalise the interface? Can they personalise the settings so we can say, well I can't see colour because I'm colour blind and I can't see red, say, or red pigment. And so therefore I want to ask, you know, change the colour to something else. Okay. Trichromic or dichromic. Could find lots of different kinds. Okay. okay. How easy is it to find and interact with interface controls and the shortcuts to them? So is it easy to get to the interface controls? Or is it a nightmare scenario of menus? You know, like Microsoft. Is it a nightmare scenario where it's just a big complicated set of menus where you think, yeah, people never use this, stick it right down. Internet Explorer, it used to take 14 steps to change the font size in the Cascadia style sheet renderer on, inter on Internet Explorer. So if you're an older user, you had to navigate 14 items before you could actually make the text bigger in the old days, before you could just press Control plus or whatever it is to go bigger. Okay. Um, you want to change the colour so that you've got a bigger contrast in the background colour, you should take 18 steps to do that. Not very accessible. Yeah. Have you provided keyboard focus? Now this is key. Most people just think, oh, they'll never go click on it with a mouse, but keyboard focus for text cursors. That is key. <coughs> okay. So you need to make sure that there's a tab order that there's a tab index, that there's a logical sequence of the way that you're tabbing, and also that you, know, you provide the focus for this stuff, which people just leave. But it's critical for this kind of work. Okay, facilitate openness. I think we've said this. It's just software open success information. Available to third party systems, that's the openness part. RESTful interface is great. What other kind of kind, what other kind of things might you use if you don't want to use RESTful? If you want to use something else, soap. Um? soap, soap, good. Another one that begins with R and ends with C. There's one character in the middle. RPC. RPC. <laughs> we might proceed to go. We might use those too. Okay. Okay. So if you know these things, you know, obviously you've got web services where you can use SOAP and that kind of stuff. You've got remote, remote procedure calls which you can also use, you've got RESTful interfaces too. Okay, so RESTful interfaces you're not going to maintain state until you understand. Okay. Does it allow input and manipulation by these third party systems too? <coughs> it's not just enough to gather the information, can you also manipulate the information and you can change it? Okay. <coughs> if your system is closed, then does it allow all, all input and output to, to pass through it? So say you've got some issues with um, openness. You've got some issues that you don't want to open up your interface. But will, when it sticks out that information, will it allow the information to go through it so that we can actually, so that other, other tools can get it on the other side? Right. Operable. I don't think we need to go much on. Can you use control aspects of the audio, a visual presentation, such as a video? For instance, on audio, on time series data, you might want to slow it down or speed it up based on the kind of person you are, what you need. Yeah? So you need to be able to really move around and manipulate time series data. Personalise the interaction settings. Okay? Is it personalizable? Can you then change the interaction settings in some way? Um, okay, can you activate everything by the keyboard? Blah blah blah. Can you control by a mouse, mouse like pointer click pointer? Okay. okay. Here's one. Are there multiple coded key presses available in the sticky key quiz sequential form? What does that mean? Yeah, is that like a Kind of, but 
it's also here we've got multiple chord and key presses. So what's a chord and key press? When you press multiple keys at the same time, so Alt and Fire, uh, Alt and F. Okay, that kind of thing. Now, what happens if you can't press two things at the same time? You've got some physical disability. Sticky keys, okay, so that's what we want to make sure. Can we make sure that your system is open to the sticky key system? Also, what about drag and drop, etc., etc., as well? Can you stick something so you can stick it and then drag it and drop it, etc., etc.? Okay, there's always something like that. Uh, okay. Here's another one. Regaining the focus. So in the old days, and still now to a lot of the time, you can't regain the focus if you do in ARIA stuff. In sorry, in uh, rich internet application stuff. Okay, so you make an you, you do something, and then when you come back from doing that activity, the focus of where you originally were was lost. If that's the case, you then need to navigate all the way back to where you originally were to try and start again. Okay? So that's a real problem in time. Understandability, I think we've got that sorted. Yeah, I think no understandability. Oh, that's a good one. What do you tie into the system by spell checker? Most people don't necessarily do that. They, talk, they either wrap their own spell checker, oh, Firefox, Thunderbird. I, or they, they don't tie into the system-wide spell checker in any particular way. Okay? So that means that there's, there can be a real problem with the kind of information that you're putting in. So if you've got spell checks, if you've got um, a spell checker which, has, which you can um, edit where you, by you can actually put different lines of text to speed up the text writing process. So you can use a keyword that then is like a macro, in the, in the, uh, which a lot of, which a lot of um, people do actually. They use, when they want to create a new, a new word, they just use a macro. It's not a macro actually, it's just a phrase that then when they type German, say, it replaces it with something else in the actual thing because they've got their own user dictionary. Okay. So that's another thing we need, need to think of. Okay, this is about flexibility. I think we pretty much know what uh, flexibility is about. Now, that's it. Paul or poof. Those are things that you guys need to remember. Okay, so what do you can tell me what you can tell me what poof poor means? Poor. Remember, you've got memory squirrels. Okay, well, you have to do the first. Perceivability. Uh, U is understandability. O is operability. And R is something. Okay, what about poof? We've got some of those. What's the a few bits we haven't got in the proof bit? Yeah? Uh, open. Open is one. What's the other one? Perceivable. Perceivable, that's true, yeah? Flexible. Flexible, yeah? Okay, good. So, keep these in your brain. Okay? Because very, it's very easy to just remember what you should be thinking about when you're coding. Okay? Okay, so next week, pop goes. An example of accessibility for everybody. Um, what is your view regarding combinatorial impairment? So before we go, have I mentioned combinatorial impairment today? Not by name. Okay, good. Okay, yeah, we're good. Is it the inability to recognise multiple things at once? No. Okay, so people have this very disparaging view of aging. So in uh, disability, I've just said that aging is one of the kind of what people consider to be disabled or a disability. But I disagree. I think aging is just a certain point where you might have <coughs> a higher incidence of combinatorial impairment. And combinatorial impairment means that you've got lots or multiple low level things that, that or low level disabilities say. So you might not be able to see so well or hear so well. That doesn't mean you're deaf blind, but it might mean that you have some reduction in your ability to perceive stuff. Okay? I'm going to put on Twitter a link to a Google Chrome app. Google Chrome plugin actually. 
And it will, and, it, and this kind of thing is really useful. It's called uh, something to do with coffee, I forget now. And what it allows you to do is modify the screen, such that it gives you an idea of what it's like to have different kinds of disability. So you can understand what it's like to see the screen if you've got glycoma, or what it's like to see the screen if you've got some kind of um, hearing, or listen to the audio if you've got some hearing impairment, etc. etc. So it'll give you a better idea of what it's like. Okay. So I'll put that on Twitter for you. On the Twitter for you. Look at that. Okay. What's the relationship between effective and accessible design? I want you to know why I'm using effective and why other people are using accessible. Uh, five main principles of effective design. The five main principles of effective design was just given. Okay. So we'll have pop quiz next week. Read your notes. Self um, self-settling questions. I'm here on Friday afternoon, so make sure if you've got any questions with Dart that you want to speak to me about, we're going to be feedback for your course and all that stuff. Okay, see you next week. Okay, so I'm going to do this one So you want a copy or not? No, actually, I, I, did, I think I did.